Hi, welcome to Town Meeting Television. We are here with the Ralph Jean Marie documentary team, a group of folks that is working on telling the story of a case in Barrie. We got a press release from you all um, just recently trying to bring light to what's going on with this story. And I'd just like to hear from you to introduce yourselves. Um, Trayvon, tell us a little bit about who you are and how you are related to this case. Well, uh, my name is uh, Trevon Groves. Uh, I live in Randolph, Vermont. Um, I actually was the first person that was made aware of this case back three years ago at the state capitol, actually, when we were protesting for George Floyd and uh, the Black Lives Matter protest. So um, when it was brought to my attention, it just, it, it struck me because, I mean, I'm a black man living in Vermont, and I mean, that could have easily been me, and it easily could be me next. So. I just, uh, it just struck me that it had to be like a, a citizen that was telling me this and it wasn't, it wasn't a big story, like it wasn't uh, big live news coverage going on about it, so it kind of, it kind of struck a nerve in me, so I felt like it was my duty to make it, uh, it known to the, to everyone around. Great. So we're going to have to hear about who Ralph Jean Marie is and what this story is. Um, but we'll continue with the introductions for now if you want to just tell us who you are and how you came to this. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> my name's Anthony Marquez. I heard about this legitimately when Trey told us for the first time. Uh, I'll never forget, actually. We were in Montpelier at the state capitol. Um, we were doing some social justice work, and he, he, he made us all aware of, of the story. And for me, at the time, because of George Floyd, because of Breonna Taylor, because of like everything that was going on nationally, it, it, it sadly took a back seat to even our own movement, which was super unfortunate because it was something that was happening in our backyard, in our front yard, to be completely honest with you, as you'll know um, as we continue the story. But, but for me, um, I, I always believe in the power of story, and I knew that if I could keep Ralph's name alive by making little promo videos, um, I, I would be able to, to help affect the story in a way where it would become important to, um, to the media. Mm -hmm. That's something else that we'll definitely get into. But for me, I just knew um, as a person that cares about story, as a person that cares about really being able to, to bring to light um, situations, uh, I, I just knew like I, I just knew I had to do something about that and so um, thankful for Trey to to put all of us in a position to be in the know in terms of like what was going on Great, Muhammad. Uh, my name is uh, Muhammad the story got to me I believe uh, through you know you had Trayvon then uh, Anthony then it got to me and at that time I was a part of an organization so uh, we just were able to incorporate the story into the general movement that we were involved in at that time. So who is Ralph Jean Marie? Who's, what's the story? Well, first, let's, let's, Ralph, Ralph is a, a son, <laughs> a father, mm -hmm. uh, somebody's cousin, nephew, brother. Um, and he was, he was, he was, he had a, a lot of friends in his town, so I mean, he was a big, pe a big part of his community. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> someone who he was dating in the past, I guess, they were hanging out. Um, everybody decided to meet up in a hotel room, right in Barry. <laughs> uh, they were all seen walking into the hotel room, but Ralph was never seen walking out. There was never any instance of his body, him physically coming out of there on his own or being carried like where you could see him physically coming out of that door. But everybody else that walked in there came out. And yet all those same people that were inside of that room when he came up missing are still out here living their lives like nothing ever happened. Yeah. So. And to be clear, Ralph Jean Marie is not <clears throat> has never been found. He disappeared and his body has never Still been found no trace. and nobody and the story is not really known. No, it's yeah. there's no I mean no clue. We haven't and I mean in our in our press when we did our first uh press release we told him like a hat, give us a hat, give us just anything, even the video of him going into there so we knew what he actually had on like 
we don't we have nothing to go on at all and they haven't found anything like they haven't even put cadaver dogs out to to do a search team for them so yeah this so this happened in the winter of 2021 is that right is this almost two years now that we're so this yeah this is like a 2020 2021 um story um and to kind of touch base to get to get a little deeper into what trey was saying the the idea that you have this man who who disappeared under suspicious activity that in itself to me requires a different way of looking at the the case in general right like it's like it, it's one thing for a guy to walk away and then to to be known to walk away and to come back i can understand that but when he was reported missing two days after he actually went missing two to three days after to me the urgency towards okay like what is this and like really figuring out what we're dealing with um is really important and that's something that the barry city police department really 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 failed um really failed and i'm not saying failed in the sense of well it, it wasn't their fault that they were told two or three days later that he went missing or that he's been missing but it's the idea that after the fact they did not act it was it was very much so kind of just we're going to sit on our hands um we're going to sit on our ask for like i mean it just in general like for lack of better words we're going to sit on our ass and do nothing um and then once it was like pressed a little more by the community right because like the community his friends again this is before the media even touched it when it started getting pressed by the the community more that's when they started being like okay like what's actually going on here they waited a month for any sort of forensics to go into his his room where he he lived at the Halloween motel in Barry uh th they waited a month to get forensics in there actually a family moved out of that room his family moved out and then another family moved back in and then they were like oh wait a minute we have to do forensics on the room um the building has security has cameras they chose to not get the camera and the security footage um, and then when they chose to go back and finally get it, it was already recorded over. Um, you, you know how like cameras work, you know what I mean? Where uh, you, like, I mean, most of these cameras, like you only have so many days before they're like re-recorded over. So they went to go back um, and get those cameras uh, and, and get that footage, there was nothing. So this is a man who lives in the community of Barrie. He's got roots in the community of Barrie. He's got friends and family there. He's hanging out, he disappears, his disappearance is reported, and you're saying it took about a month it for the police to respond at all, and that was after? Um, they responded within the first um, couple days that they were told, but yeah. like the response was very lackluster. Uh -huh. They just thought that they were looking for a person who had walked away. Yeah. from the hotel, yeah. which in all reality, and I mean, like, let's face it, like we live in a country, not just a state, but we live in a country where if you or the beautiful young lady behind the camera or someone who doesn't look like us but looks more like you guys went missing, yeah. immediately there would be a different level of concern, a different level of passion, and a different level of awareness when it comes to there, there, one, there might be a killer on the loose, and two, there's a person missing who, who looks like us. Like, I mean, we need, we need to work. If it was, if it was again, um, and we said this before, if it was like a, the cop's white daughter, you know what I mean? If it was the mayor's white daughter, if it was, I mean, white son, you name it. Like, if it was the, uh, the, the chief's, the chief's son, the chief's daughter, the chief's mother, the chief, like the chief's wife there would have been a different level of concern. Uh -huh. um, because he is of, of low income, because he is a black man, because he, um, he, he was um, in and out of a world that like some of us don't, don't fully understand, um, that doesn't mean he's incapable or should have less support or should, should, um, should legitimately, like why are you giving somebody missing the benefit of the doubt? Uh -huh. You feel what I'm saying? Like it's yeah. like how does how is he getting the benefit of the doubt of if he's alive or not? And we're going to just we're going to just like ponder this this idea um, f f until it's too late. And th and that's what they did. They they sat on it. 
and, and they know they sat on it. Um, we'll get into more of that. And to be clear, I mean, following up on your point, none of you knew this man before you heard his story. So, I didn't know. Or, I know we have mutual friends, so I had, I've ran into him like once or twice, but yeah. he wasn't like a, like me and Anthony, we talk every day. I, I didn't talk to him. Like I've never yeah. had like a personal conversation, but I mean, that, that didn't mean but anything. But there's something like that. that stirs you. Exactly. Muhammad, there's, is there something that stirs you to be involved well, and to want to tell the story? Well, yeah, of course. Uh, I would say to start with, um, let's just look at the data. We have approximately 35% of the people missing in America being black, and so we consist of 14% of the population, and you have about 65% of Europeans in America, and they consist about 65% of the missing people. There's a clear discrepancy Wait, say that, there. Say that again. There's 12% of the population. No, 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 we are 14. 14% of the population. Yes, and we're missing 35% uh, of the collective missing people in America. Yeah. And Europeans are 65%. Yeah. And they're consisting of 65% of the missing people in America. Yeah. Meaning, if you equal, look equal, at... Equal, equal, unequal, unequal. There's yeah. definitely a problem there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very evident. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, if you look at that, it's just, it's very clear yeah. that there's a problem here. It's as if when a black person goes missing, there's less value that went missing, less yeah. valuable thing that went missing. You know, it's as if when a white person goes missing, well, it was an important person that went missing. Let's go look for them. Let's pay more attention to this person because they were someone who was more valuable compared to a black person. Yeah. And so it's a bigger problem than just Ralph Jean Marie. It's, it's a national problem. Yeah. And and unless we're looking at it from a national perspective, we will never be able to address it collectively all the way. You know, once we find Ralph, whatever happened to Ralph, then what? How about the rest of the 35%? What yeah. are we gonna do about those? Yeah, yeah, and I think there's a similar um, disparity with n Native women who go missing, like an, an incredibly large number of Native, I'm, I'm shocked by the numbers. I mean, I think people listening uh, and maybe particularly audiences that aren't familiar with this are gonna say, well, exactly what you were talking about, like involved in communities that are transient or talk a little bit more about that. Talk a little bit more about the, the, you know, why that data is important and why that, what, why that data tells a story that's really about the humans. Well, I think, like, uh, I mean, just going at it, I think a lot of people use that to try to dehumanize someone and try to, like, take it away and just take away from, from you just being actual a human being. So it's, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't hold any weight there. Like, just because someone might, be, might have an addiction problem or you, you just never know what's going on in someone's life. And, and to touch back what you said, Ralph doesn't have family that live here actually. So that's, that's another thing that touched me here. I don't have family that lives here. I have this circle of friends that I've made here and that's it and a couple of people I, can, I hope I can depend on. Like if something like this happened to me, are they gonna put the effort out for me too like this? So that's what made me really think like, I really don't care what Ralph's past is, what, what he was into or what he wasn't into. That's, that's not for me to judge or for me to even care about. What I care about is that there's a black man missing and it was suspected foul play and that the people who should be held accountable and should be being held and actually questioned about this are not. So imagine, right? And this is what I always try to get people to understand, right? Like, and I mean, like you can, you can break it up as simple as this. Like imagine if you were a person, right? Like it's just you, yourself, you're walking into a store um, and you just never walk back out. And then three years later, the only information that anyone has, like right, anyone from media to, to friends to family to, the only information that anyone has from the cops is, it's a very complex situation. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, it's like, it's very complex. It's very complex. And it's like, the only thing that's really complex is like, how did you guys not think to walk over to the neighbors to, uh, to question them on terms of like, like, did they hear anything? Did they see anything? How is it, how is it a proper excuse, right? Um, 
and I know, <laughs> Trey and I know this very well, but how is it a proper excuse to say, um, it slipped our mind, right? Like that's like, that's, that's the type of information that we're actually getting from the police department. After three years, it slipped our mind. Like there, there are things that we wish we would have done earlier, such as life. It's just like, okay, that's not, it's not a good excuse. Again, if Trey and myself walk into a building, a couple white people walk into a building, Trey and I are the only ones that walk out, those people are never seen again. I'm telling you guys right now, there are going to be charges dropped and there are going to be charges st that stick mm -hmm. because the level of concern from, for the level of concern for the opposite sex, the level of concern for um, politics and like what side of the, uh, the equation you're on, whether it's the right or the wrong or the middle, like whatever, like, like minorities in general are always trying to defend themselves at all costs. Like mm -hmm. there's, there's no way around it. So the idea that it's taking people of color um, and don't get me wrong, like we definitely have some white allies that are like all for what we are doing. Like mm -hmm. some of Ralph's best friends um, who have been like truly doing the work even before we stepped in. Mm -hmm. um, but they, I mean, they are about it. Um, but it, it's just not enough though. Mm -hmm. And it's really scary that you, you can, see, like there are some things that I wouldn't dare even do. You know what I mean? That like, and especially in front of cops. Um, and it's like, you've just got this cesspool of ignorance happening and the, the, the cops, the, the, the police department in general are able to just get away with saying like, it's just, it's really complex. It's like, how can it be that complex after three, three years? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If the people that you're actually dealing with are like um, drug addicts that you claim like are just like, you know, menaces to society, if they are low income, that like people, the people that don't have jobs that do nothing all day. It's like you, you've already casted these people as just like human beings that just don't deserve your attention mm -hmm. um, or your, your honest hard work and mm -hmm. effort. You've already casted them as that. Yeah. So it's like, why are you sitting here three years later telling us like you have nothing? Yeah. And why is it you have nothing because we can show that like you've done nothing? And, and, and I mean, they just, they just hide behind every little uh, crevice of this investigation and it's, it's disgusting. And like some of the things that we have proof of, it's, it's very, it's wild, it's very wild. There's been a little bit of coverage. I know mm -hmm. I read a little bit up on it and I'm just wondering if you wanna point people to a place where they can find more information sort of about the story. So this, is this, three, this has gone on for three years. Mm -hmm. And as you said, I know there's been activists that have been pressing the Barry Police Department to be forthcoming, to be involved, to tell the story. What, who, who out there is telling the story well enough that you would recommend uh, some, back, some background <laughs> information? Um, all right, so to be, to, be, uh, to be completely honest with you, us. Uh -huh. Like we are the only reason why the media even cares. Take this for example. All over America, there are news reporters, there are journalists, there are people that are like fighting for like the hottest story. Uh -huh. Like what, like I mean like, they want to break the internet with the biggest topic, right? Um, you have that. And then there's Vermont, where nobody's fighting for a story because they care more about um, the old lady down the road knitting or they care more about the fact that like, oh, it's, it's, it's fall and the foliage is changing. Um, they place all of these, it's like you live here. Like why do you care so much about like that story? Um, they care more about the feel good stories and the, uh, they, they, they just have no desire to go and like one, find a story, two, follow a story, and three, hold themselves accountable to that story. Yeah. Um, Th th there's none of that. Um, even at our press conference, it's like I'm looking at some of the media that was there and it's just like, you guys don't even want to be here. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, mm. you guys actually don't want to be here. Um, actually, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me and my team. Like, creating this, this promo video, this campaign video that we launched and that we had to email blast to you. This has been a thing now for three years 
and you guys weren't going to do anything. And how do I know you weren't going to do anything? Because we had it on the 14th. We purposely did it on the 14th because we knew he had went missing April, thir I mean, he was reported missing, excuse me, April 13th, right? Um, to me, it's like, excuse me, he was reported missing April 15th. He went missing supposedly on the, the 13th. Okay. Yeah. So to, to us, it was just like, let's do it the day after. Uh -huh. Let's do it the day after he went missing to, ju to just see if the media will will do something on their own or if the the, the police department will will put out a statement or anything like that they didn't even acknowledge it yeah and so like to me it's just like there you go we invited the mayor to the press conference dude didn't even show up didn't even like send a mayor of Barry. yep the mayor of Barry didn't even show up and i'm like dang i was like at least the i even said it i was like at least the burlington mayor shows up when he's called upon I was like, this guy doesn't even show. Fa I don't even know who the mayor is, to be honest with you. I don't even think a policeman stepped outside. No, we were actually not on one. their front lawn, and yeah. not even a policeman didn't even step outside the front doors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, so, <laughs> what I'm hearing from this is that, besides, the, I mean, that this means something beyond. I mean, to, I mean, maybe it's the, maybe I'll say it inartfully, beyond the life of Ralph Jean Marie, this means something pretty intensely to you as people, like you're feeling a relationship to him and that you're feeling yourself when you look at him. The, we, we are him. We, yeah. like, we're literally, we are literally Ralph. Like, he, like, his, his heart beats, we, our hearts beat. It's like, we, we look like him. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, it's just like, regardless of who's tall, who's small, yet, like, uh -huh. this is the efforts that you're getting and this is, like, what you're being shown. Um, is there more, are there more details in that that you want to talk about right now? Because I think, you know, three years, there's a lot of, there's a lot of details there's, there. Yeah, there's, there's and, just so many. Um, <laughs> I mean, we can really get into it. Uh, What's well, Like all his stuff being left there? I mean, the, I mean we could get cell. into like everything, but I'm <laughs> saying like, what are your thoughts, what are, what are your thoughts, Marlon? Like what? Well, uh, if my memory serves me right, he uh, left his wallet, mm -hmm. correct? He left his glasses and his prescription. Uh -huh. um, and like uh, Anthony told me before, if he left one of those things, all right, that kind of makes sense. But he should at least take his medication because uh -huh. he's going to die if he doesn't take yeah, it. Sickle You're saying it wasn't, an, it wasn't an accident. He, no, it, it was wasn't like, not oh, an accident. I just left my wallet behind. It can't be he an accident. He left everything. He left, even if you were mad and you got into an argument with your uh, female friend, yeah. you'd at least take your medication because you need it to survive. Yeah. And if you, you know, if you leave it, you will come back for it because you will remember, oh, I need that. He did not come back to get it. Yeah. So what does that mean? So your feeling at this point is he's, he's probably been murdered. He's just, well, we don't know. You don't we're, know. We're, not, we're not the cops. Not they should there. be doing yeah. that. I mean, okay, so yes. The answer is yes, yeah, though. Like, sure. It's not like, I mean, it's not like this man walked away, had a heart attack, or walked away, committed yeah. suicide, jumped off a bridge, yada, yada. Like, it's not like that didn't happen. Right. Um, as he was just saying, that this man left his wallet behind. He left his glasses. He's legally considered blind without his glasses. Mm -hmm. And he left his medication. Um, he has sickle cell anemia. He was picking up his medication every two weeks out of Boston Medical Center. He hasn't been to Boston Medical Center to pick up his prescription in three years. Mm -hmm. It's just like there's no I mean, like he's he's obviously dead. Right. And if he would have checked in and used his debit card or anything like that in like in any place ever or found a new home and like if he, if he was to rebuild his life, if he had rebuilt his life somewhere else, there'd be documentation of that, right? And there's not. And so to, to, say, to say that he, he is still alive would almost be ignorant and to assume that he's not dead would be even more ignorant at this point on terms of like, the ones in charge of the investigation. Um, I'm hearing you, Muhammad, you're saying this is the this is the job for the police department. To that's correct. Finish the investigation. Well, even when it comes to like figuring Sir. out, you know, um, the fact that he's he's alive somewhere around there. Are they even investigating that? Are they looking into records of him reappearing using his car? Are they even doing that? So like, how would they know? Like nobody's had a conversation with them. If you were to sit with the Barry police. I'll be able to talk to them and tell them what you want. 
You wanted to be heard by them. What would you want? What would you want to tell them? And what would you want to hear from them to Well, know? here's my whole question. Why do they have to come to us to do their job and ask us? Mm -hmm. It's a missing person, period. Why do you need to come to us and ask us? And then not even that. Are you that, so, like, are you no, that? Me, I just don't understand. I, I'm, I'm, miss, I'm Ralph's missing a step okay. here. Yeah, what so happened? So Ralph's, Ralph, Ralph's family lives in, in Boston, okay? So they're three, four, five hours away, so none of them are close to here. So obviously, as this investigation has been going on, Ralph's family, who we met when we had our, um, we had a little, uh, little get-together for Ralph and bringing more awareness for it, and his family actually came down. And we got to meet them, and we've been in contact with them still. And actually, Anthony's been talking to most of his real closest, his close, close family, the whole three-year span. And they have, they've called the police, um, no answers. Uh, the one time they did talk to him, which was what, a couple of days before we did the press conference. A day before. It was after we had already made a big, a big thing about them not returning her calls, not having any communication with us or with the family to like give them any kind of answers or any kind of closure to this. And finally, whenever we're about to have this press conference, they call and say, oh, sorry, we don't have any more information for you. Well, I mean, trust me, there's a lot of things we'd like to say to, <laughs> to the police department, but like he said, we shouldn't have to even ask them anything. Exactly. This is your job. Like you get paid to do this. We don't get paid to do this. I get paid to do what I do for my business and take care of my family. I shouldn't have to go outside and outside of what I do and do your job. It, it just I, I don't know. I don't get it. Early, <laughs> early on, um, Ralph's family reached out to me and like they had found out that I did film promo videos, yada yada yada. They asked me if I would make uh, a campaign video for them to, to be able to, to stress, because they're, they're scared to come to Vermont. They think if you come to Vermont as a person of color, you end up missing, you're done. Like that's, what, that's, how they, that's literally how they view this state. Mm. So that in itself is just beyond messed up. Um, but can you blame them? Um, with that being said, they hit me up. I didn't, again, I didn't really know much about the story, so I started doing my own research a little bit. I'm like, all right, if I'm gonna do this, and I already know, like, most people know, like, if Anthony gets involved in something and he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it, um, and he's going to really do it and piss people off. And so for me, I'm like, sure, I'll definitely do it. So I went to Boston, sat down, spoke to them, interviewed, like, the family, interviewed his older son, Ralph's older son. Um, he's now 17, close to 18, um, if not 18. And then I came back home, hit up Muhammad. Muhammad helped out with the video. Um, I don't know if you were part of the first campaign video. I don't think you were. Um, but anyways, we, we, we did this video, put it together, um, we launched it, and I just pretty much hit up the family before we launched it, and I told them, I was like, listen, like, if we put it out there, like, it's out there, like, this is forever. So, boom, we put it out there. And I mean, the video, it was, it was really good. It was really good because it, it meant a lot um, not from the production standpoint, but it meant a lot to the family to, to just have reassurance that people cared, right? And like they couldn't believe that, that this many people were going out of their way, per se, to, to, to keep Ralph's name alive. Um, so we put it out there, and I want to say within maybe two hours, like the, the video itself, it's like we're getting like 3K, 4K, 5K views on it. Um, people are coming out of the woodworks. You know how performative people are. Um, the performative people come out of the woodworks, but at the time, like it served a purpose because they were they were sharing the video. You know what I mean? I want to say three days later, um, I get an email from the Barry City Police Department, and it's actually the chief, Tim, uh, Chief Tim Bombardier, and he asked me if I would come in um, to the to the police department to to speak to him. And I was like, no. Like, no, I don't want to do that. And he's like, no, no, please. Like, we would love to talk to you about something important. So I was like, whatever. So I go in and uh, I meet with like the head detectives, the lead detectives there. Um, and I meet with uh, the chief, I meet with the sergeant and they're all sitting there. And he basically was like, we would like you to help us get information out to the community about the case in a way that's not going to, um, not going to destroy the integrity of the investigation, but in a way that we can like communicate with the public about what we are doing. Um, 
I actually took a couple of days to think about it, talked to some of the people, my documentary team that was like helping out. Um, some of us were pro about it, some of us were not pro about it, <laughs> let's just say. Um, and I just made a decision based off like, you know, like if we're asking for questions, maybe this is our best way to, to get those, those answers. If we're asking for answers, that this is the best way. So I agree um, and we, like, we sit down and we do an entire interview, um, but the interview with the cops was based on a timeline that they wanted to put out. So automatically it's like they weren't really wanting to be interviewed. They just wanted to, to, to get the community off their back because they were under fire because of the campaign video. And so we, like, I mean, I put this timeline together for them and we put it out to the world. And again, that, that, I mean, that got, that got 10K plus views. Um, I mean, that was like, again, another this well is video done. This you did with the Barry this Police is, yes, Department. Yes, correct. So I did a campaign video for the community, technically, the family. Yeah. And then, then I did a timeline video of the investigation and, and hopefully where. Maybe we can air these after this. Absolutely. This, we'll tag this on to the end of this conversation Absolutely. here so folks can see those. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, with that being said, the, the timeline came out and it was, it was very just, uh, they were speaking, they, were, they, spoke, they spoke in essentially riddles. They were saying, well, uh, we were told this, we were told that. So everything early was just kind of like, this is what we were told. And I'm thinking to myself like, by who? And like, if you were told this, like what, what actually carries weight? What is real versus what, like, what you were told? Uh -huh. um, Three years later, you realize um, they were told everything because they were too late to investigate anything. And they're only basing their information and their investigation solely off what they were told by persons of interest who a thousand percent are involved in Ralph Jean Marie's disappearance. So one of the things that occurs to me, and you know, we're, we've kind of, we're approaching 45 minutes mm -hmm. here, so, and this, this is not a story that can be told in 45 minutes or an hour, half an hour. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm going to apologize that no, no, to our right. viewers and to you all, this is going to be short. But I think, you know, for a lot of white viewers listening who are <coughs> used to, not everybody, but <coughs> used to being able to pick up the phone, I'm going to call the cops, I have a, you know, I feel like they're going to respond. I may not understand what's the, what's the, you know, why is there this struggle? Mm -hmm. Why is there the struggle with the police department, this uh, mistrust? And just if you could talk about that a little bit. I'll let uh, Muhammad go for it. Uh, I'm gonna let you guys go, I wanna gather my thoughts. All right, so there's definitely, a, there's a huge disconnection between, uh, let's just say the black community and the police department because frankly, <laughs> we get targeted a lot. Like. Me, me per se, I can say me, I have personal experiences here where uh, we, can either, we can talk about racism with dealing in the job and then dealing with the police where every time I've dealt with like, I've had jobs here where I was a manager and I had to, like there was older white people who were under me and I'm not, I'm a very cool, I'm a very laid back person. I don't try, I'm not, if I'm the boss, I'm not trying to act like I'm the boss. We're all the boss, let's get this job done the easiest and the quickest way we can and get out of here. But then I got to deal with being called the N-word because they don't want to deal with someone younger and this, and this color. And you know what I get told by HR? Oh, it's just a generational thing. Just get over it. It'll be fine. Oh, okay, whatever. Cool. So then I have a day. Let's say I'm coming to work one day and I get pulled over three times within 15 <coughs> minutes of going to work. Mind you, it only takes me less than 20 minutes to get to work. So I got pulled over three times in that, in that little short span of time. Now I get to work, now I'm in a bad mood. So now this happens again. I get called this word again. This is the third time I get called this. Now I lose my patience and I say something, now I'm the bad guy. Now the cops are down here. Now there's seven to 10 cops at the facility dragging me out of the building, but I'm not being hostile. It's not like I'm here trying to fight anyone. I'm just, I'm making my point like this and I shouldn't have to deal with this disrespect where I work at. And then you guys are gonna bring seven to 10 cops down here. I don't have a weapon. Like I'm not, I'm not, I haven't made any kind of violent threats and you guys are gonna come and drag me out of here. Like it's, it's just, it's bad. So yeah. it's just, it, you don't feel safe when the people who are supposed to serve and protect you 
have a target on your back and like and aren't even aware that they're ex- aren't even aware that the target is in their eyes exactly maybe. and it's just like <laughs> yeah yeah but like you don't feel safe when you have people that think hanging up a black lives matter flag or poster exempts them from racism being racist being like anti being like not i mean like you i i'm just so tired of performative acts of kindness um i'm tired of we are so woke um i'm tired of um this state is exempt of racism or i'm tired of the question like do you really feel is it really, is there real racism? Is there real racism in Vermont? It's just like, are there black people in Vermont? Are there people of color in Vermont? Mm -hmm. Like, are there white, yes, yes, yes. It might not be in the form of cops pulling you over, dragging you out of the car, beating the shit out of you. Um, It might not be in the form of that, but like I can tell you many times where like the system has had their knee on my neck and all I could do is sit there and, and plead um, and defend myself. And like, there's nothing scarier than defending yourself to people that like actually don't give a shit at all. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And like, these are the people that are in these systems. These are the people that run these systems. And again, perform the, the performative stuff is just like it's like when you call somebody out on their very own bullshit. It, it, it's it's funny and how quickly they run back to the system. They run back to the same system that they're that they're trying to tear down because it's 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 built from within. The racism is built from within. It's just like yeah, but like you play an active part of this system being what it is in the first place, and stop pretending that you don't. First, I want to appreciate you taking the time to share that because it's an emotional labor to tell stories of having to deal with junk. So I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Mohammed, I don't know if you want to weigh in about this um, idea of mistrusting yeah. so, systems and the police. Yeah. I want yeah, I want to just make sure that this is not fear. I don't think uh, black people fear cops. I think it's it's mistrust. Um, and that's also why we run. We run from them because people always ask us, why are you running from the cops? We're, we run from the cops because, first of all, they kill us and they get away with it. Uh-huh. As a matter of fact, they get paid to kill us. Uh-huh. So then we talk about, oh, well, lynching is over. Well, you're just lynching us with something else. It's bullets now. And you get paid for it, too. So we run, away f- we run f- because of that. And we also run because that is time in prison that we will never get back. Mm-hmm. We're human beings. We deserve to live our lives. And that's what, another reason why people don't understand why we're running. We're running for many reasons. We're running because we f- you fill up you fill us up with all the we fill you fill us in these prisons, most of whom are men. Uh-huh. Then you wonder why the black men black, black kids don't have any men role models around them because you fill you fill you you fill them in, in these prisons. Uh-huh. There's no men around, yeah. so now they don't have this role model, and now it's just oh, the, the the black woman herself, and she has to bear all of that. That's a lot to deal with as, as just a woman. You have to be the, both the mom and the dad. So that's another reason why we run. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's just there's a, there's a lot of reasons, and, and as a white person, you just can't really understand that because you're not the one that's running. You're the one that's chasing us. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, bottom line is this. Until we stop running, and until there is no more reason for us to run, America will still be a racist place, and as long as there's racism in America, we will never trust the cops mm-hmm. because they only refor- enforce racism. That's all they do. That's all they're doing. Cops, they don't, they don't see it. Exactly. Like, they, they, they legitimately, like, I'll never forget a conversation that I had with a cop in St. Johnsbury. Like, this dude, like, I, I was being nigger bond by these kids on, like, this, uh, like, I was headed home. No, I wasn't. I was working, excuse me. Um, and I was being nigger bombed by these kids walking across this bridge. And, like, I'm like, you know what? I'll handle this later. This is your hometown. This is my hometown. This is your hometown yeah, yeah, yeah. where you should feel most safe. Absolutely. Among your community of family Absolutely. and family. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I get I get uh I get home and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna definitely gonna call the cops. And this is more of like a because like screw the cops at the end of the day. But this was more of like a test to see like what is this even like what conversation do you have with a cop when like you don't feel safe because kids are allowed to even like cross you like that, right? So they come and I asked them, I was like, uh, these kids were, and I mean, we had video of it. And I was like, these kids 
um, like as I'm working or walking around calling me a nigger, um, how, how should I go about that? And they're, they're, literally they were like, there's nothing you can do. And I'm like, what do you mean there's nothing I can do? They're just like, well, I mean, um, it, it's, freedom of, it's freedom of speech. Um, I was like, but they were like literally assaulting me. And they were just like, no, they, he was like, no, they weren't. And I'm like, he's like, that's just their, that's their prerogative. And I'm like, they were assaulting me. And he's like, how is calling you a nigger not, a, uh, how is calling you a nigger an assault? That's how he, that's how he voiced the question to me. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking to myself, like, first off, like, don't ever, ever, s- don't say, don't say the word back to me. I know exactly what I'm they talking say it's about. So fluent Correct. And like it was just so fluent. But it's like, why? Why did you flip out. the question on me? Like, like how is how is nigger an insult? I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I was like, this is like, you, and you're protecting and serving, and like that is like you're asking me a black man that question, and then you expect me to give two flying hoots about what happens to you. You expect me to salute you. You expect me to not kneel during the national anthem. You expect me to be proud and put my hand like right on my heart and, and sing the national anthem or sing the pledge of, like it's like, say the pledge of allegiance. It's like, what allegiance are we even talking about? Uh-huh. Like it's not my allegiance. And I can tell you right now, the, uh, the, the, the whole idea of like this, this we need to stand for America. It's just like, okay, but like why when I protest America, like, why do I, why when I'm protesting during the national anthem, anthem, do you think I'm protesting like, like America? Like, I'm actually just protesting racism. And, and it's like, we, we got to figure out how to, to handle that. And I, I don't think, I don't think there is an answer. And that's, that's the, that's the scary part. I don't think there is an answer. So right now, um, thank you. Mm-hmm. And right now, you all are working on this documentary. You're going to keep working on it. What's mm-hmm. the What's your plan? What's your goal? How do people find out more about it? Um, right now, we are going to continue to look for Ralph. I say the um, goal is to find Ralph. Yeah, that's, like, that's where we, we're going to find Ralph. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's we, what's going to happen. We made a pact to not put out any sort of like production until like without putting the investigation first. So like we launched our own investigation. And we're about to do a community search very shortly. Um, as of right now, like really, it's just following our social medias. Um, we haven't wanted to glorify this thing, mainly because it's real. You know what I mean? It's happening. And it's not like something where you can sit there and, 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 and scream justice for Ralph when you don't really have people that care too much about what that even looks like, right? Again, if it happened nationally, everyone would be involved. But because it's not a national story and it takes real work, it seems like it's very hard for people to get out of bed in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where we're at. Yeah, so. well, there's a lot There's a lot going on mm-hmm. in the realm of injustice mm-hmm. that people are dealing with. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, it's hard to, I imagine it's hard to have stories be heard mm-hmm. and people's attention span is limited. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mohammed, what's for you, what's the next? What's next in this? Um, well, you know, we're working on this documentary. So Anthony's the main photographer, and uh, me and Trey are just, you know, we're trying to be supportive in that sense. And also, um, if there's a search party initiated, we'll be involved in that and anything else. Um, at the end of the day, we're doing a job that we shouldn't be doing, you know, because we have our own lives. And But we do feel that there's some element of importance to investing our time in figuring out what happened to Ralph Jean Marie. So uh, that is the part that I'm going to be playing in this whole situation. Great. Well, thank you all for coming in today and telling this story. And um, is there any sort of last words that you want to leave or places that people can go to find out more information about this? Well, I got a final thought for everyone to just think about two actually final thoughts that actually came up while we were talking. So. One is to reiterate what Anthony said earlier. Just imagine, so this, this building is actually perfect. So let's just say, and this is just what I want people to think about at home. Just think about me, Anthony, Muhammad, and yourself walked into this building. Uh-huh. There's cameras around, obviously. They've seen us all walk in here. Us three walk out of here. You don't walk out of here. Never seen again. Do you think we're, having this, we're sitting down having this interview and telling this story? I don't think so. I really don't. So, I mean, that's just, I don't know. 
Mm-mm. I know, and then the other part is, Ralph has a family who who needs closure. And I'm sure everyone at home would be thinking, if this was my family member, I would want closure. I would yes. want somebody to care about my family member being missing or being murdered. So just something to think about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I think I think that's perfect. I uh, I would just ask Vermont in general to understand that these are real stories that are happening like in your state. Uh-huh. I mean, it's not like this is happening in New York or this is, and I'm not saying it's not, I'm just saying like, it's not like, like I have, oh man, I have white people all the time asking like, you as a black man, what would you want us to do to support like your movements and stuff? It's just like, it's like what are you talking about? Uh-huh. It's just like, you see every single day that we're out here on the like the black top doing this work and like you have the audacity to just ask the question you know what i mean like this this is how like do what you can stop asking me what you can do mm-hmm. you know what i mean like do what you can because like at the end of the day it's like after we find ralph it's like like our lives don't just like end you know what i mean like we don't just stop doing this work there's a whole lot of people that were screaming a lot of things two years ago three years ago about like how much they were like they they just wanted to be a part of a movement but here's the thing like it's it's called movement movement nobody calls backwards movement forward movement like if i fall backwards i still call it falling forward if i'm willing to learn so it's like a movement doesn't stop just because like you you accomplish one thing mm-hmm. like a movement only can enhance and grow from there and so i would just tell vermonters like and i would tell the media like shame on you guys because like you you don't care. Like you, you really, like the media does not care about this story. Like mm-hmm. I shouldn't have to be busting my ass to like continuously create content for them to pick off my, my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I shouldn't, I, shouldn't be, I shouldn't be having to do that, but yet I am because it's only interesting to them if they see other people interested. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's, it's scary, mm-hmm. it's very scary. And this is literally, the number one story in Vermont when it comes to what can you do to to support people of color? It's like, how about like really support the fact that a person went missing three years ago and under like the most craziest suspicions ever and nobody's doing anything, nobody's screaming anything. There's a white woman right now that's getting more attention still from her case and she's been missing for what, 15, 20? 20 some odd years and I'm not saying it's not like sad and she doesn't deserve that's not what I'm saying yep. but I am saying like how do you constantly remember her but refuse to like remember something so like so fresh mm-hmm. you know what I mean it's so fresh how many last thoughts I think uh, I think every, everything has already been said yeah well I appreciate you all coming in mm-hmm. and um, you know, good luck with the continued work. Yeah. And um, thank you all for watching. Um, this is Town Meeting TV. This forum, community forum, is available to you as well to use to tell your story. And um, we appreciate it. Patrol received a call of a missing person, and they dealt with it as a missing person, as a person that had walked away from the hotel and could possibly be just somewhere out there. So the initial complaint on the Ralph Jean Marie missing person case came in on the 15th in the evening, um, a little bit after nine o'clock on the evening of the 15th. And a friend called in and reported that Ralph had been missing since the 13th at around one in the morning. So initially, uh, officers that responded were um, uniform patrol officers re- that responded to the case. There were some things in the beginning that weren't quite right. Um, the fact that Ralph had left his glasses, medication, and his wallet behind. Um, <laughs> officers continued to look around the area, didn't find anything, called the hospital, he hadn't checked into the hospital, hurt. Um, as the case went on, we involved detectives from Barry City PD to dig further into this. So they checked surrounding areas. 
Uh, I know that they had a canine check the area behind the hotel days after the incident. We checked around the, the rivers and the bike path and areas that somebody could have just walked away a, a short distance. Numerous areas around the hollow were searched uh, by, on foot, by dog. Um, Officers were out looking for anybody that matched the description of Ralph Jean Marie. Um, once the detectives got involved, um, and and before they got involved, there was a missing person flyer put out regarding Ralph Jean Marie's disappearance. But then we started checking into things deeper, uh, checking locations. Were there any videos? Checking locations for possible witnesses. Uh, and re-interviewing the people that were initially involved in the complaint. Um, that's been ongoing since the 15th when Ralph Jean Marie was reported missing and officers continue to do that today. So early on in this case, um, we utilized canines for search. The initial report of Ralph's disappearance was that he was upset and you know, that he just may, took off in the middle of the night. Off of um, that, that article that's everybody knows you go running through the woods in the middle of the night and there's plenty of them around uh, the Hollow Motel that you could be hurt or injured. And that was the reason why we used a uh, patrol canine to search the area initially. No, the initial press release we sent through um, email, the email was no good. So then it was, I think two days later, because it was a Friday, so two days later when we got um, back to work, when we realized that the that it didn't go out, we ended up trying again and didn't get, we were without luck for that. So we started calling news agencies and uh, we actually faxed it. So we went with the old fashioned way and faxed it to all local um, news agencies and we didn't get any response and then it was days later after that we started calling news agencies to to let them know like this is what we had going on early on we had missing person flyers um, we put out press releases um, I know that some of those got bounced back at a later date because they went by email but we had other press releases that we made sure that we got directly to news agencies and I think Ralph T. Marie's disappearance fell by the wayside on the news part of things as a result of COVID. COVID was number one front and center um, in everybody's mind and on every newscast when this case initially started. The chief secured a $5,000 reward and a press release was then sent out again to address that reward to the community in hopes that somebody would come forward with some some type of information. So there's been three to four inquests of individuals to give testimony for this case. I think that they're, the family's getting misinformation that has to do with this case. People are hearing rumors and they are reaching out to the family through Facebook and everything else trying to tell them you know, I just feel like some of it's false hope for them. So the other thing that that's not unique to this case, it is part of any good criminal investigation, is what law enforcement does and does not release to the public. I mean, when we release information, when we tell people what we're doing, um, when we show pictures of, you know, the robber at the convenience store, it's for the purpose of finding out who did the robbery, or finding out, does anybody know this vehicle? Can anybody identify this person? But it's done with a purpose. So releasing information or putting information out in the public just for the sake of putting something out and not having it be productive is not something we would do in this case uh, or any other good criminal investigation. People are often critical of, well, we want to know. We, we should know. Um, you really put detectives at a disadvantage if you put everything out there. You know, detectives are still going around, they're talking to witnesses, they're talking to 
people of interest, and they have to be able to sort out if somebody's credible, if their information's credible, is it something they can put in an affidavit for a search warrant or an arrest warrant? Um, and the way to do that is people involved in criminal activity know things that sometimes only the detectives and the criminals know. And to put that out in a public setting uh, puts officers and detectives at a disadvantage. Not a good thing to do. So the other thing that goes hand in hand with controlling the information that's out in the public and only putting things out that are going to benefit the case and not hinder uh, investigators' ability to do their job is also, why do we do this job? And it's not for putting all our information out to the public. This is for Ralph Jean Marie, uh, it's for Ralph's family, and we're doing this to put some closure to this case. Um, these things take time. It's not the 40 minutes you get out of an hour-long TV program, and things don't come back from the lab in five minutes or less. And people need to understand that this is a serious thing, serious things take time, and we're doing it for one reason, and that's to put closure and help family members out. My name's Raphael Marseille, son of Ralph G. Marie, and I felt like I should just get this off my chest. I just really appreciate everyone that's helping me and just taking this into consideration, even though everyone has their problems in life and helping me, because like this helps me and my mental health. My name is Fabiola Williams. Um, Ralph G. Marie is my cousin, and we grew up together. And somehow we ended up um, losing touch. Like, he moved um, out of Boston, Massachusetts, moved to Florida. At 17, Ralph came back to Boston. April 13th, my cousin Barbara had called me. And she was like, Fabby, Bridget called her and said that she hasn't seen Ralph. Ralph just left. I said, what do you mean he just left? She said, yeah. Um, Bridget said that he left his glasses, he left his wallet, he left his clothes and all his belongings. When Barbara said that to me, I said, Barbara, she killed him. Barry City Police still don't know what happened to 38-year-old Ralph John Marie. He was last spotted near the Hollow Inn in Barry City. Police were told he walked off without his belongings after having an argument with his girlfriend. Washington County State's Attorney's Office is also involved in the investigation. They say police didn't know Jean-Marie was missing until 68 hours after his disappearance, something that hurt their search for evidence. It was so sad. Still, a year later, you guys did not give the FBI, like, you all did not call the FBI and ask the FBI to help. Nothing. No answers, no nothing. Why can't you guys just call the FBI and ask them to help you? That's the whole point of the FBI. If you can't do it, if you feel that you, you search everything, you did everything that you could possibly have done, then give it over to the FBI. That's what I'm saying. If you don't give it over to the FBI, I'm thinking that you all are being shady. Police believe someone knows something, so they have a $5,000 reward for anyone with information. I have lost hope that Ralph's still alive. Police say more than anything, they want to give the family closure and answers. They're hoping someone can help fill in the blanks and bring justice for Ralph John Marie. It's been six months since the disappearance of a Barry man. As police continue their investigation, the family is calling for answers. I want you to meet with some of our black leaders of our choice. I'm asking to meet in the house. We should have to continue to stand on this lawn to have this discussion. I want you guys, today when you guys go home, there's a story going around that's been going on since the middle of April. And if you guys don't think that there's uh, some racial injustice in this, in this uh, society, here's a brother by the name of Ralph Jean Marie who has been missing since April 13th. 
it is a suspected foul play because his his ex-girlfriend is white and the other members of this story are white nobody's been arrested there is no investigation going on i just want you guys to think about if you're white if i came up if i was suspected for kidnapping one of you guys do you think i'd be up here talking to you right now do you think there would be an investigation and charges dropped already yes i think so it's been nearly one year since ralph g marie of barry went missing your family you know someone that you loved or you know have a heart say something that's shady something is going on and i'm gonna keep on saying it we're gonna keep on believing it yeah we're gonna think that it that ralph was murdered because he was black okay because you all still haven't helped him out at all at all y'all haven't did anything call the fbi 